would stand to your feet if you will. I'm going to read through the scriptural references. We're going to be coming from uh, three of the Gospels. We're coming from John, Mark, and Matthew. All right. John, we're coming from John 13, 34. Mm -hmm. Mark, we're coming from 12, 30, and 31. And Matthew, we're coming from 5, verse 44. I'll read that. I'll say that again. John, we are coming from 1334. John 1334. Mark, Mark 12, 30, and 31. And Matthew, Matthew 5, 44. And I don't expect you to turn that quick. If you cannot, I will read through them right there. It is on your Bible app if you are able to get to the Bible app on your phone. You'll see it right there under the events. Agape is live and those are the events and they have the scriptural references right there. The word reads, John 13, 34 says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Mark 12, 30 and 31 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Yes, Lord. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. There is no commandment greater than these. All right. And Matthew 5, 44 says, but I tell you, love your enemies yes. and pray for those who persecute you. All right. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Yes. Be to God. Amen. You may have your seats in the presence of God. As we have entered this new year, the Lord has yet again given me a theme for the year. Something that we might focus on, something that we might relate to our daily lives, something that we can think and meditate on, something we can measure our talk and measure our walk with. And the theme for this year and the focus of today's word is love, love, and more love. We are being called higher. And as we desire more, as we dig deeper, it is important that we increase our love so that other things don't begin to take precedence and the scales become unbalanced. Because in actuality, love <coughs> is the sum of all the other things combined. Right. Let me explain what I mean by that. Love cannot and must not just fall in the basket of things to do as a Christian. And if we were to weigh it and we were to put things on a scale and, and you got a side over here and you got a side over there and, and, and you began to place things on a scale such as stewardship and such as evangelism and 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 such as 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 being kind to people you began to just place these things all these one of reading your bible and praying all the things that we comprise to make up who we are as christians what should not go into this pile over here is love it is not one component that can just mix in with the rest of them. Because if we mix them in with the rest of them, that means that it is in essence equal with the rest of them. And it is not. It must not. Instead, love must sit on a scale of its own. And everything else that you place on the opposite end then will weigh down. And in order for the scale to remain balanced, you must increase your love All right. so everything over here doesn't outweigh it. Mm -hmm. Because if you just got a little bit of love and you put one ounce of love
love over here and you got one ounce of, of, of faithfulness over here. Well, it's balanced, right? But then what if you put an ounce of stewardship over there and then you put an ounce of, 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 of kindness over here. You put an ounce of this and an ounce of that. Before long, then that one little ounce of love is overshadowed. Instead, love must continue to grow as you grow. Love must continue as you put more and more things on you as a Christian, which we should, because as we grow in Christ, we should have a longing to be more like Christ. And so then our prayer life must increase. But as your prayer life increases, so must your love. Yeah. And a lot of times we let love fall on the back burner. And what was sufficient for us when we first became Christian, we let that be sufficient amount of love for the rest of our Christian walk. Mm -hmm. I came into Christ and I began to love people more than I ever loved them before. Great. Wonderful. But has it matched up to all the other things now that you're 10 years in? Is your love matching up with all the other things that you've added? Mm -hmm. See, when I first started in ministry, I had a desire to sound smart. I, Pastor Pam was my mentor, and if y'all have ever heard Pastor Pam talk, Pastor Pam, she can rattle off scripture real fast, and she, she can put things into context, and she, well, you know, the Bible says that she's so smart, and I, and I said, ooh, I want to do that. So I had a desire to sound smart. I wanted to be able to, to be one of those, those, pe those preachers that were profound and, and they spoke prolifically and prophetically and I wanted to do that. And I enrolled in school. And I soon realized that more important than to sound smart was to actually be smart. <laughs> And so I said, ooh, I, I want to be smart then because it's a byproduct to sound smart if you are smart. So then I got a new focus. I said, I want to be smart. I want to know the word of God. I want to be able to not just spatter off scripture because it fits into a context I've heard before, but I want to know the ins and outs and the in and depth and ups and downs of where that scripture came from. And I want to be able to dissect the word, to rightly divide the word. I want to be smart. And then I began working in ministry. And I realized that more than being smart, it was important that I had love. For even Paul says that he could, if he could fathom all mysteries, but have not love, that he is worthless. And so I said, yeah, yeah, I, I must love people. I must have a heart for people. I must actually care about people. And it's great that I have knowledge, and it's great that I can sound smart, and, and it's wonderful. But if I cannot be loving, and, and I cannot uh, actually have any type of compassion in my heart for anyone, what good is it? Amen. But then I became a pastor. Yes. And when I became a pastor, I realized that more than having love was that I was effective in showing that love to others through service. For what good is it having love in your heart if you're no good at showing it? All right. Amen. And to be effective in showing love means that my heart had to be challenged because with each new challenge would come another opportunity for me to show more love. All right. See, love is one of those things that grows as it is challenged. Right. Otherwise, it just stays where it is. You don't get a larger sum of love unless you are challenged with an opportunity to not love. Right. Love is just like patience. Patience is the same way. Lord, bless me with patience. You pray for that and you will be challenged with an opportunity yes, to be Lord. patient. Yes. Because that is how you increase patience. Yeah. By a challenge toward patience, so that you can display and practice patience. Love is the same exact way. And you cannot expect 
that your love grow without no challenges attached to it. See, but many of us get caught up because love is one of those things more than patience that tugs at us. Yes. Because love is scary. Mm -hmm. Love means that you attach and you connect and that you invest a piece of you. And when the person that or object that you are connected to challenges your love, it hurts. Mm -hmm. And it is one of those, it is one of the most painful processes that anyone will ever go through to be more loving. The real deal, to, to grow more love, it is one of the most painful processes, but it is also one of the most rewarding. Jesus had the epitome of love. And I really believe that in this new season, God is going to test the heart of those who say that they love. And he is going to begin to reveal those that say that they really love. And he is going to differentiate them from those who are talking to those that are really walking. Because there's a difference between someone who speaks the words of love versus someone who really is acting in love. God is going to test the hearts of those who say they love but are really just trying to look good. Because when you get to the heart of it all, what good is all of the wisdom? What good are the fancy words? What good is the prolific and the prophetic speech? What good is knowing the definition of love and even knowing all the different kinds of love there is in the, in the Greek kinds of love and the classifications of love if we fail to put that love into action towards one another? And when I say one another, not just one another sitting in this room, but one another living on this earth. See, see, while you in this room are family, we can just go ahead and we are family because we know each other. We, many of us are already members of the church. If not, we're looking and we may be coming. We consider ourselves family. And I bet you one thing right now. If somebody were to walk through these doors to threaten one of us, I don't care if I know your name or not. No, you not. I'm standing up. No, you not. Nobody going to come out and point somebody out and say you right there I want you I got a problem with you and you need to come out here and handle it before all of us get up because right. you got a problem with one up in here <laughs> we all coming out because I want to know what's going on and I want to see because we family right I, I, I want to see what's happening because and I, I may even stand beside you if not in front of you because I want to know what exactly you got to say Amen. to my brother or my sister because we family Amen. but no. while we are family in this room everyone in the city of George or city of Savannah is also family All right. like it or not we Savannians Lord, that's right we are. We, and you've lived here for more than a month. You're a Savannian now, too. <laughs> and the bottom line of it is, if ever there was a threat to our city, we coming out. That's right. No, you not burning. I know why Savannah ain't burned to the ground, because, you know, we came out. We, no, you not burning Savannah to the ground. It's our city. That's right. And if somebody said, I'm going to light, they got a lighter and some gasoline. No, you're not burning Savannah down. This is our city, and I am not going to let it happen. Because we family in Savannah. More than Savannah, Georgia. More than Georgia, the United States of America. All under the same flag. Some of us born here, some of us not. But we live in here now, and we are a country. And that means we're family, that means that every single person that you're looking at, that person is also an American citizen. An American that, that, that bleeds the same red, white, and blue that we all bleed, don't we? Everybody like, no pastor. <laughs> Monica and me and the other ones that serve, we like, yes! 
<laughs> but regardless, we all Americans, right? But then we also North Americans. And really put it into perspective, we have a continent of people. We got Canadians and Mexicans too. They belong to our family of North Americans and, and North America, but then North America also belongs to the earth. And if you really put it into perspective, I love that Independence Day movie because when the aliens came, it didn't matter whether you was in Asia, Russia, America, whether you was down there and you was uh, in the trop in the, in the Caribbean, you were standing up for the earth because if the earth gets taken out, we all get taken out of here. And I'm going to set the differences I have aside with the man in Iran when the alien comes to take all of us out. It don't matter anymore about Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan and what they got going on in the Middle East and what Israel got going on and what's happening in Africa and I don't like them because they look this way or because they talk that way or this is the religion that they have and this is our religion when it really boils down to it we are inhabitants of the same earth that's right. yes, yes. I know that's fictitious but it opened our eyes to something that when something is threatened all of a sudden, you won't have a problem gathering together. Y'all remember 9-11, and this is within our lifetime. Before that, those may remember Pearl Harbor. I'm sure the same thing happened. But when 9-11 happened, all of a sudden, we for real was all Americans. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because when we are challenged, when, when there's a threat to our family, we began to really figure out who that tribe is, and we connect to them. And the, pretty much the bottom line is, if you are for us, then you on my side. If you're against us, you over there. Yes, sir. Now, the problem is we let walls, boundaries, and borders tell us who our tribe is. We segment ourselves as an us and a them. And anyone on the outside of us is not really a real person, really. So we don't consider their plight. We don't consider their pain. We don't consider their joy because they are part of a population we refer to as them. Mm -hmm. But what if you began to see yourself in them? And then all of a sudden, they became us. Mm -hmm. How much more compassion would you, compassionate would you become if there were no divisions in your love? Let's be honest, it, it's human nature to love in levels, to love in classifications. It's yes. human nature. That's why there are four different Greek words for love. Yet, only one of them is the expression of love that Jesus commands. That's right. Only one. The three verses I read pretty much cover everybody. We were praying with Lil Maya last night and then, you know, now lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep not to die. You know, you get to the part, bless mama, and, you know, you get to blessing people individually. You know, this was me as a kid and I'm teaching Maya. I'm like, bless everybody I know and bless everybody I don't know. The end, good night. Like, you know, that covers everybody, no? <laughs> that was me. That's what I used to say. So, <laughs> teaching already had to be lazy. <laughs> Cut corners, baby. Everybody you know, don't know, Ooh, everybody covered. <laughs> well, the verse I read, the, the three verses I read, they pretty much cover everybody. It says, this is love God, love one another, love your neighbor, and love your enemies. And I want to clarify for a minute, if I can, each of these, just to be sure we haven't left anybody out. Can I do that for you? Yes. Because it says to love God. The Greek word here that it uses says feels. Love God. Who is God? And I wrote down a few things and if you agree with me then, then cool. And it says that God to me is the divine ruler of all. He is the creator of heaven and earth. The alpha and the omega. The beginning and the end. He is the great I am. He is the way maker. He is the almighty provider. He is the God of peace. He is the ultimate healer, the ruler, the conqueror. He is the supreme deity. He is the Lord of lords, the king of kings, the God above all gods. He is the creator of the universe and beyond. The omnipotent, the omniscient, the omnipresent. He is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He is the God of Daniel, the God of Sarah, the God of Elijah, and the God of David. Oh, he is the God of the Maccabees. He is the God that conquered all. He is the God that went around Jericho and caused the walls to fall. He is the God that parted the Red Sea. He is my all in all. He is God above everybody. God above every 
unconditional love, without condition. We are commanded by Jesus Christ to give this God our agape. The scripture says agape, the, and that's in love, the Lord your God. And when you think of who he is, yeah. that's not too hard to do. The agape yeah. love. Yeah. Pretty much just give back God the love he gives to you. Yes. Yes. My Lord. That's right. That's right. Mm. Then it says this. It says love one another. Mm. One another. Who is one another? <laughs> now, one another, that's the members of your tribe. Mm. Specifically in this context, other Christians. All right. We're called to love other Christians. Mm other followers of Christ. In fact, Jesus says that those, uh, that the world will know us because of our love for one another. The Bible says agape one another. Same word used here. That's not too hard. Because if you love me, I love you back. There, there's no, that's not hard to do. You love me, I love you. Because you're kind to me, well, I'm going to be kind to you back. You part of my tribe. You Christian. Why wouldn't I love you? Christian love. Agape love. Mm -hmm. Then it says, love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Now here's where it gets tricky. Mm -hmm. Your neighbor is anyone outside of your tribe. All right. The neighbor is the stranger. Mm -hmm. The person you don't know. In other words, people that may not have the same belief as you that may not have the same skin color as you, that may not have the same sexual preference as you, may not have the same economic background as you. They may speak a different language or a different dialect of the same language. And we are called to love them, check this out though, as ourselves. We, the Bible says, agape your neighbor like they are you. Love them as if they are a part of your tribe. Right there, God is saying to tear down the division, tear down the wall, tear down the barrier, tear down the border, and agape. Yes. He didn't say filio. No. Which is what many of us do to the outsider. Filio is the friendship, the brotherhood type of love. Yes. It's a notch down from agape. It's a, it's a little bit of a condition there. It, it, see, it, it says, well, I don't quite love you. I don't agape you, but I'm not going to hurt you. It, it's a brotherly love. It's, it's a love of, now, if you do something, because you, you, you one step, I, I'm, you ain't agape, so you one step, you do something, then I may change now. But I'm going to love you with a brotherly love. But Jesus said to agape them. He didn't say filio. And many of us love them as a brother, the neighbor. And we give them a lower classification of love because they are different than us. But we're called to agape them. <laughs> Sorry. Lastly, perhaps the most difficult, the Bible says... <laughs> love your enemies these are people who are not only outside your tribe but these are people who hate you and now let's be honest some of our enemies are even in our tribe but they still hate us these are people who want to harm you surely pastor you must have done a word study on this and surely when you looked at the Greek Surely Jesus did not say to agape our enemies. Come on now, Pastor. Tell me there was a different Greek word that Jesus used when we have translated it to love our enemies. Tell me the Greek puts it into perspective that we don't really need to agape our enemies. Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but Jesus says to agape our enemies with the same type of love as you have for God with the same type of love that you have for the creator of heaven and earth is the same type of love you are called to love those who have no love for you back that's right that's right but why why is that important pastor other than just because god said so give me a practical reason as to why he said 
Why he requires this of me. There is a reason that the symbol for love is a heart. There's a very real connection between the physical heart and what the Bible refers to as the heart of man. The spiritual heart, if you will, is the heart of man. The heart of your spirit man is the core of your being. And that heart is what will govern the direction of your life. Now listen to me now. Just like a physical heart, the spiritual heart must also train. We all know that our physical hearts, we must train them for long distances, right? Well, your spiritual heart must also be trained. Trained for what, Pastor? Well, the Buddhists call it nirvana. It's been called spiritual awakening. Some people will call it enlightenment. But Jesus called it this, the kingdom of God. And this is what he said. Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you. There are people reaching states of enlightenment and nirvana synthetically through meditation, deep breathing, chanting, silence. And Jesus pointed at us and said, we can reach the kingdom of God organically because it's right there in us. And we won't walk into it. This discourages me. We have the living God who has transformed us and placed the kingdom inside us and as Christians we ignore it daily. Meanwhile, there are people working for the same thing and achieving something really close to it. That is why you can walk past people with other religions and they're nicer than Christians are. Sometimes I'd rather sit in a room full of folk that are not Christian than I would want to sit in a room full of folks that are Christian. Because Christians are the most judgmental, they're the most irritating, they're the most condescending, they're the most high and mighty people you ever want to meet. And they're negative. But people from other religions, they're the kindest, sweetest, want to see the world a better place. And they, and not all, I'm talking some, not all Christians are this way, and not all people from other religions are this way. But generally speaking, when you come across people that have that little coexist sign on the back of their bumper sticker, those are some nice people, they're kind. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you, those are some kind people. They love people, and they will hug you and sister and you know they, they are kind <laughs> they're loving meanwhile you reach somebody with that little fish on the back of their bumper sticker and they cut you off in traffic they'll sit there and get your parking spot and look at you as if you did something they'll bump into you in the store don't say excuse me or anything else they won't speak to you nothing they'll judge you look you up and down look at your baby in the cart and look at you and try to figure something out <laughs> yet Jesus said that we have the kingdom of God in us and other people are catching on to the fact that they can reach it synthetically and they pray and they, they meditate and they're disciplined and they try to treat people kindly. The thing is they have an outside inward type of transformation going on. Meanwhile, we have the kingdom of God in us and we refuse to let it out. All right. Kingdom of God just locked up in us like, you excuse me, can I come out please? And we're just like, mm -mm, no, I don't want the kingdom of God today. <laughs> The kingdom of God is urging you to come out. The kingdom of God is inside of you. The kingdom of God requires, though, that you set aside your flesh and tap into your spirit, man, as 
to allow your spirit man to govern you on your daily walk. I watch day after day Christians rejecting the kingdom of God for the world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't want the kingdom. I'd rather tap into the world today because it's more fun over here. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I watch the world grasping for straws looking for the kingdom. And I really believe that if Christians really would show the kingdom of God, that more people that's searching that are in the world will say, hold on, hold on, hold on, how did you get that? Because that's what I've been searching for. That's what I want. That's what I thought I've been trying to get, and I'm getting close to my meditation. But if I could get to where you are right now, show me what you did. What chant did you do? What candle did you burn? What gem do you carry along in your pendle? What are you doing that I can do so that I can end up, and then it's an opportunity to witness. We should not have to go to people and be like, do you know Jesus? How about you? You know Jesus? That should not even be in our vocabulary. Why? Because our light should be shining so bright that people are coming up to us saying, hey, uh, excuse me, what is it about you? Because I see something in you. You're so kind. You're so loving. What is it about you? I want to know what you do. Come on, guys. That's it. People should be coming up to us wanting to know. And we can then point them to the way. Yeah. Yes. But we must train our hearts. And I really believe love is the key. This love thing is what we got to get over as Christians. <clears throat> we got to get over this, bro. This is the, the battle of the flesh right here. The love key. Mm -hmm. Because many of us are lacking in love. We have put it into the basket with all the other things. When actuality, it must outweigh everything because it must even out everything. Love must increase as everything else increase. You read well, you need to love more. Right. You worshiping more, you need to love more. <laughs> you giving more, you need to love more. Mm -hmm. Love must increase. <laughs> it's going to take us getting back. I really believe that in this season where the people of God are getting back to living and having kingdom living, it's going to take us loving like Jesus said to do it. See, he mapped it all out. He gave us some specifics here. And I just pointed out where he said, what he said to do. And I know where we're going wrong. We're not loving right. We love God. But then all the rest of it, we're just not doing it right. My God. We're not agapeing. We're not agapeing one another. We're not agapeing ourselves. We're not agapeing our enemies. And we're sure not agapeing our neighbors. We're not doing it right. We got to get it right. Okay. And we must train ourselves to this. Let me show you this. A sprint is a run that is run with your might. A sprint is a short distance. Y'all seen sprinters? They get on the starting blocks on the set, boom, and they go and they run real fast. Blah, 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 they get to the end. And any one of us could cover that distance. Any one of us, maybe not as fast, but any one of us could cover that distance. Even if you got to walk it, you cover it up every day when you get out your car to walk into the store. Any one of us can cover that distance. That's not a long distance to cover, right? And many of us are using our love walk like a sprint. Mm -hmm. Middle distance. Middle distance is run with your mind. Anything, <laughs> any, I say 5K, because I don't know about y'all, anybody that's ever running here, but when I was running half marathons, a three mile would still be like difficult for me. Yeah. Like, I ran it sometimes 16 to 17 miles a day, but when it came to a three-miler, I'm like, whew, here we go. And around about the second, third mile, my legs start getting a little tired. You can feel them. And I'm like, whew, my leg. And my breath get a little, a little sporadic. Whew, my breath. Because then you have to bring your mind into it, and your mind got to tell you, uh-uh, you can do this. You got it. Come on. You can do it. And that'll keep your legs going. That'll keep your breath steady. You got to tell yourself, in, breathe. Out. And you got to be kind of cautious of how you're breathing and how fast your legs are moving. Because if you go too fast and you're running three miles, you're gonna conk, you gonna conquer. You gonna you gonna want to stop. But if you get it right at the same that that nice little sweet pace right there, gotta be cautious of how you're running. Um, is everything in alignment the way it should be? Am I relaxing my upper body? Because if I get to tensing it up, you know you got to check yourself while you're running three miles and anywhere beyond that. You check yourself. And many of us, some of us have made our way into the training our hearts and like we run in a middle distance and we're checking ourselves every now and then and we're wondering okay am I loving right here every turn am I loving right okay what am I doing wrong what can I do better 
but a, 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 a marathon, 26.2 miles. I've never run 26.2 miles. Most I've ever run is 17 miles. But I heard that a marathon must be run with the heart. Because physically and mentally, you're done. After about the, they say about the 21st mile, you're done. Your legs are done. <laughs> Everything is done. Your mind is starting to give up. Girl, just stop. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're done. And the people I have talked to that have run marathons say the only way they finish is by connecting the heart. The core of you must want to finish the marathon. The core of you must get involved. The heart must come into play. And, and long after your might and long after your mind have given up, the heart must continue and it will bring the rest of you into submission so that you can finish. And I've experienced something like this when I did do my little 16, 17 miles because yeah, around about, you know, when you see the little mile marker that say you got three miles left, you get real exhausted real fast. Like I wish the mile marker was not there just let me hit the finish line. Don't tell me how much more. Because, man, you get tired. When you, you done ran 10 miles, but then you see three more miles to go. <laughs> Something inside of you got to click in. And then the same thing happens spiritually when you've been loving all you can love and you have done so much for folk. And then the same people that you sowing into be the same people that want to turn their back on you. Be the same people that want to talk about you. Be the same for love. That's why when somebody hurts us, we still love. That's why we love ourselves. That's why we love our God. That's why we love one another. That's why we love the outsider, our neighbor. And that's why we love our enemies. Because when we learn to love for real love, 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 and more love, we reach the kingdom of God. We bring the kingdom of God to the forefront. And we are able to live in the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom? Of love. Yes. Love, love, and more love. Yes. How do you walk around with a smile on your face? Love, love, and more love. How do you walk around not worrying about everything? Love, love, and more love. Because the kingdom of God is in me. Yes. Love yes. is always the answer. Yes, amen. It's what we have been missing, mm -hmm. but I believe if we cross the barrier, mm -hmm. if we tap into it, it's what's gonna get us over. Right. How many people wanna see the kingdom of God while you are still alive? Yeah. See, I don't wanna wait till I get to heaven. Yeah. See, that's something totally different. Many of us have read the verse and we're like, ooh, that's, that's they talking about heaven. We're not talking about heaven here, we're talking about the kingdom of God as two separate things. Heaven is a physical place that can be seen the kingdom of God, yes. Jesus said, cannot be seen because it is in you. It is a state of being. 
Oh, I know what they say. They say, oh, oh, pastor getting into that new age thing. No, I've described two different places in which Jesus also described. He described two different places. And I'm just going to kick that out the window right now because I've heard people say, heaven is a state of mind. No, the kingdom of God is a state of mind, is a state of being. Yes, yes. Heaven is a place. That's right. And I'm not trying to reach heaven while still alive necessarily, lest the Lord bring me up, but that's a place. Yes. That's right. I'm trying to reach the kingdom of God, which is a state of being. And like I said, some people call it nirvana. Some people call it enlightenment. And that's something similar. But I'm trying to reach the kingdom of God, which is the same. And I was, it's not the same exact thing, but it is the real thing. It is the real feeling. It is that flush of I have not a care because I am ruled and reigned over by God himself. Yes. Complete rule and reign of God. I want to reach that place before I close my eyes and reach heaven. We can get there. It's going to take love. Number one, it takes the kingdom being placed inside of us. Through Jesus Christ, we are given the keys to the kingdom. We're given the kingdom. 